Dr. Griffin Millsap has been working on brain-computer interface technology since 2008. His doctoral thesis was on human speech neuroprosthetics using implanted electrocardiographic arrays. And here at APL, he is working on our neuroscience group to push the limits of what's possible with non-invasive neural imaging. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Griffin Millsap. I just really wanted to like highlight how um, impactful this moment is to me because I've got a bunch of people from like various stages of my life that have like helped me get to this point, um, uh, including um, like, like all the way back from like uh, um, undergrad. I've got Justin Ringa in the back here who was my undergraduate um, roommate. Um, he helped, actually helped work on this technology back in 2008 with me uh, at Rensselaer Polytechnic, um, which apparently today is like rep your old school day um, at, at APL, so we're repping. Um, also, Will Kuhn, who uh, I worked with back then as well in uh, Gerb Schalk's lab, um, and then all the way up through um, uh, you know, graduate work at, at Hopkins, uh, you know, Matt Pfeiffer's uh, also at APL, he's my direct supervisor, and I've also now got a few students here, I've got Naveen, who will be giving the talk um, after uh, me on, on spatial selection and augmented reality, and I'm also joined today by Eitan, who is uh, another student of mine. Uh, and uh, Wade Lewis, actually, who's giving the simultaneous talk in the next room, will be a student of mine uh, in the next semester. So we're all working on um, augmented reality and BCI stuff, and I'm just really, really happy that, that everyone was able to, to make it out. So um, Now, when we talk about brain-computer interfaces, you might have a very uh, different expectation of what's possible and like what the state of the art is. Uh, just from its appearances in uh, feature, you know, like, like fiction, uh, you know, movies, video games, uh, actually, when putting this slide together, I found that there was a lot more brain-computer interface content in Eastern uh, literature and Eastern stuff than, than Western, so I thought that was an interesting tidbit there. Um, but we are uh, a far cry from, from these types of interfaces. In fact, uh, this sort of stuff of like high-fidelity um, uh, you know, motor decoding, uh, you know, brain-to-text, brain-to-speech, um, the whole I know kung fu memory uploading, um, dream decoding, uh, you know, we are uh, very far, far away from that, um, and, and it's, it's actually, it's interesting to note that a lot of people come into brain-computer interfacing thinking about these sorts of things. It's like, well, hey, I heard in the news that we've got BCIs, and, um, you know, can we put these on people and, like, monitor their cognitive state while they're going through their day, and, and uh, you know, see, like, like monitor their workload and, and like, common human-machine teaming ideas. Um, and I actually put all of that currently in the science fiction category as well, at least with um, non-invasive neuroprosthesis, which is primarily what we're talking about today. Um, it's uh, this, this whole idea of, of cognitive BCI remains far off, and it's not something that's going to go away. Or it, it, the, the, this gap is not going to vanish just by throwing more money at it. There are like fundamental knowledge gaps that prevent us from doing these sorts of BCI. Um, really, what the state of the art in BCI looks like today is more like this. Um, these are the, the high points, the pinnacles of what we've been able to accomplish. Up, up here in the top center, uh, this is uh, Jan at uh, Penn, who was able to use the APL modular prosthetic limb to uh, do self-feeding. Um, she has an intercortical array implanted. Um, there's another one here, which is a handwriting BCI, actually. We put a, 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 a sensor in um, motor cortex, and the person... Uh, you know, p p writes out letters, and we decode the letters uh, from their imagined, uh, or uh, attempted, actually, attempted hand movements. It's a fun distinction there. Uh, so uh, um, I guess one thing that you can see across all of these interfaces, though, is that um, these are all invasive BCI, uh, which is not what we're talking about today, but they also represent the high, the high watermark here for what's been achieved in the field. And uh, you'll also notice that these are really only put into people with severe... Um, uh, need. Uh, people that, that have a spinal cord injury, people that have like ALS, people that need a BCI to interact with their world. Um, this is not something you can just get an elective surgery for, uh, for, for giggles. Um, these are, are um, you know, very, very early stage clinical trials. Um, and instead, uh, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to take a, a further step back and we're going to talk about kind of the state of the art in non-invasive BCI, and, and really, um, it boils down to a few parlor tricks. I'm going to talk to you about two of those parlor tricks today. Um, Naveen is going to uh, talk to you about a, a, another one, if, if you'd like to stick around for that. Um, but this is where I, I really like to start with, um, at a high-level uh, systems neuroscience. And I promise, um, I just did this outside. I went really, really long on the neuroscience part. I didn't get to VR until the very end. I'm going to try to front-load uh, that, that a little bit now. Um, 
But anyway, um, this, the, the key thing to take away from this picture is that the brain in many ways is kind of like a, a neural network. Um, I mean, haha. Uh, it, it has inputs, it has outputs, um, the same way that an artificial neural network has input layers and output layers. Um, and what I'm highlighting here in these colors are the input and output layers of our head's neural network. These are, are the places in green here. We've got motor cortex. That's where your brain coordinates activities for your, for your um, muscles and, and, and outputs of your body. In fact, it's really one of the better output areas of, of the brain. And then we've got three input areas that are highlighted here. We've got sensory cortex in purple, auditory cortex in blue, and visual cortex in green. And just to orient you, the green part there is way at the back of your head there. So um, your eyes would be on, on the front part, um, you know, kind of towards the, uh, the left side of, of this graphic. Um, and, and really, a lot of BCI boils down to these inputs and outputs of the brain, at least to what we can do today. And it turns out that these areas are really, really well understood. We've been studying them for a long time. They are, um, they are they're pretty consistently organized across individuals, and uh, you can pretty easily detect a large-scale uh, activity in these areas from the scalp. And by large scale, I mean very coarse um, activity. Um, everything in between that, though, all the rest of the brain areas that you see there, um, with, with, with a few exceptions, are, are what we would call association cortex. These are your intermediate layers of your neural network where all of your wonky representations live. I'm not gonna say we know nothing about these areas. We, we actually know a fair bit about the site, like cellular organization of the association cortex, but what's important is that um, all of your higher level cognition um, thoughts, uh, um, everything that associates your body's inputs with its outputs, which is everything that we would call consciousness, that's all represented in these intermediate areas here. They're not well organized between individuals. They are not consistent, and they're very, very difficult to understand the same way that we don't really understand the intermediate layers in our modern neural networks today. This is what ultimately is the distinction between uh, what BCI could be and what BCI is, is understanding everything that's not shaded here and being able to use it for BCI. So um, when we start talking about non-invasive neurotechnology and what's actually compatible with augmented reality, um, we're, we're really kind of talking about two different things here. EEG, which is a really simple, well-vetted technology. In fact, uh, next year, EEG celebrates its 100th anniversary. It was invented back in uh, uh, 24, 1924, um, Hans Berger. And, and if you want to think about it really simply, you, have you ever seen like a multimeter where you've got kind of two voltage probes? You put one on one side of your head, you put the other on the other side of your head, you look at the number, and then you write it down 256 times per second, and that's, that's that little voltage trace is the EEG. It's as simple as that. Um, there's also um, FNIRS, which is a little more complicated, measuring a slightly different thing. Uh, it's... Um, really looking at metabolic processes. Um, as your brain uh, does things, it needs oxygen, and uh, the oxygen is brought to that part of the brain by this thing called hemoglobin. Deoxygenated hemoglobin and hemoglobin have different um, ab light absorption properties. So if you shine lasers in at source locations, and then those photons go in, they bounce around, they come out, and you detect them at detector locations, you can actually measure the amount of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in that part of the brain, and that's a slower... Uh, time scale, it, it kind of ramps up on the course of six seconds after the neural event and ramps down six seconds after. So it's much better for like passive types of BCI, monitoring of semantic activity, um, various, various things like that. But really what, a lot, what jumps to a lot of people's heads uh, with BCI is uh, direct control. I want to imagine this thing happening and, and, and then have it happen in, in my world, like kind of telekinesis, telepathy. Um, FNIRS being a much slower signal is a much slower thing. We're not really talking about that in a lot of these cases here. And, and really, I, I want to emphasize this. Um, augmented reality in particular has a really tough input, uh, um, like, like interaction uh, strategy right now. It's, it's like, have you ever seen somebody wearing a HoloLens? They put the thing on, they're kind of staring off and doing a lot of this, and it's, it's not... It's not really a, a usable interface. In fact, the keyboard, you're literally just like finger pressing buttons and like virtual buttons in front of you. Um, you know, there, there are other things like, you know, gesture interfaces, speech interfaces, ways to get around this with technologies today. But I actually think um, EEG-based BCI has the capability of kind of transforming that interaction in a couple of important ways. So... Um, 10 minutes in. All right, so I'm going to tell you about some of these parlor tricks. Um, so with, with EEG, um, one of our, our um, 
more well understood brain computer interface technologies is called the motor imagery uh, or mu rhythm uh, BCI. This is an endogenous BCI, which is a fancy way of saying that I can just make this happen whenever I want. Uh, it does not rely on external stimuli, and we'll talk about one of those next. But the basic idea here is that um, uh, let's, let's just say that, like, this talk is really boring for you, and you're falling asleep, and you got your eyes closed, and your, your brain is not, like, paying attention or processing anything from its outside world. Well, what happens is that there's this, this volley of, of, of information from your body's sensors that's being fed through the thalamus and sent to the cortex about 10 times per second. So if you put your little voltage probe on, 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 on your head, you'll see this, this 10 hertz rhythm at all times throughout, um, throughout this, this period where you're just relaxing and not doing anything. But now let's say you wake up and you decide that you really want to move your fingers in a very particular way. Um, that, that type of, um, uh, like, like, like say you play piano, um, that type of coordinated, complicated behavior is something that your brain actually needs to work very hard to do. Um, that, that patch of the brain and motor cortex becomes very engaged, and it stops responding to the input volleys uh, from, from the thalamus, and it really starts doing its own kind of calculations and, and a lot of more complicated stuff, so it stops exhibiting this 10 hertz rhythm that I talked about when your brain is, is at rest. So this decrease in 10 hertz rhythm over C3 and C4, bilateral motor cortex, uh, this can be decoded. And um, basically, when, you, when you're moving your hands, we can kind of tell from your neural signals that you're moving your hands. And, and that's a BCI right there. Um, now, now, you might say, well, do I have to actually move my hands? And I would say, kind of, um, but not really. Um, you can actually you know, put your hands down and as still as you can, like, you know, try to imagine moving your hands. And without moving your hands, it's a tough task. Um, and you can kind of do the motor rhythm BCI just by trying to move your hands, but not moving your hands. So um, this is that one of the interesting distinctions I mentioned earlier with um, all these uh, um, uh, paralyzed and ALS folks that have these BCIs. When they are using those BCIs, they are actively trying to move their body. They are trying to say things. They are trying to write. They are trying to move their, their hands. When we get that type of high-fidelity neural recording, um, you know, it's, it's great and it makes for a great demo video, but if you were to try to take that exact same technology and put it in someone who is able-bodied, they would actually be moving their hands to get that type of decoding. So a lot of um, this type of BCI is like, well, if I have to move my hands or almost move my hands to do it, um, why don't I just use a, a joystick or, or a controller? Um, and and there, are, there are arguments for and against that, but this is just one of the parlor tricks we have in our book. Another one is exogenous BCI. Now, I mentioned that we have this one output area and several input areas to the brain. Um, how do you use an input area to drive a volitional output? Like, how, how, do, I, how do I use the brain's input to um, you know, enact my will on the world? And um, one of these I'm gonna talk to you today is about this P300 interface here, really simple type of, uh, of neural, um, neural signal, um, actually, um, Naveen is going to talk about the SSVEP, which is these flashing targets on the side here. But for now, um, direct your attention to the series of images. Um, what the P300 response is, we also uh, kind of call it the, the oh crap response, um, uh, you know, just, just for, for, for fun. But the, the idea is, is that you, 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 send a, you, you show a bunch of pictures in this rapid serial visual presentation format, um, and then um, your brain likes to play this game of which one of these is not like the others. And if you get an image that has some content in it, which is unlike everything else in the, in the series, that evokes an oh crap response, or the P300 response. And, and that response, if you do this multiple times in a row, and you look at target versus non-target stimuli, and you average that evoked response, you can actually see that come up above the noise. And that P300 response uh, is a way that your brain attentionally modulates uh, a response to an input signal. So, where does augmented reality and mixed reality kind of come into all of this? Well, this is what non-invasive BCI still, for the most part, looks like today. Um, you've got people sitting in a chair. Um, the people that use these, by the way, are, are people with you know, mid to late stage ALS for, for communication. Um, and you've got rows and columns of flashing letters. Each time I, I focus on a particular letter for 30 seconds and rows and columns of letters flash, and, and I, I really focus on that one. And, and over the course of 30 seconds, we can kind of tell that which one of those letters I'm focusing on. We type that letter, and then we move on for the next 30 seconds to the next letter. This is a very painful way of using BCI, and it requires me to stare at stimuli on a screen for you know, 30 minutes just to type a, a single sentence. Um, it's, it's, it's painful, um, it's not great, and the bigger issue here is that it's all locked down onto a screen. Augmented reality and mixed reality 
um, allows you to put stimuli in your environment at locations that are spatially relevant. Um, and, and actually what I'm showing here is an example of an SSVEP-based BCI, which um, Naveen will talk more about in just a second. But the basic idea here is that when you fixate on any one of these strobing stimuli, you can kind of see it in visual cortex whenever it changes, so you can get an idea of what someone's looking at. And more than what they're looking at, you get the idea of what they're paying attention to. If you've ever used an eye tracker before, there's actually a pretty decent uncertainty area. Um, you can't really tell where, uh, you know, which individual stimulus someone's looking to, looking at within like a five degree field of, or five degree of their field of vision. Um, but you know, th this, this could uh, tell you which one of those things they're paying attention to just based on the, uh, the, the timing that the stimulus changes versus the timing of when you see the evoked response in EEG. So um, not gonna talk about this. Uh, okay, so that brings me to what we've built. Uh, this is our internal um, mixed reality research platform. I call it the black box BCI for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is a uh, 3D printed black box uh, that I designed over the course of the pandemic. Uh, all the plans are freely accessible. Um, in fact, you could go out and go to GitHub, build this whole thing today if you wanted. Uh, it uses off-the-shelf components. Before the pandemic, this would cost about $500 to build. Um, nowadays, because the chip shortage is crazy, um, it's about $1,000 to build this. Um, but uh, the, uh, the black box BCI is, is a black box. It also contains black box neural decoding algorithms. I'm using convolutional neural networks to decode motor imagery on this, on this BCI. And actually, we're running everything off of a Raspberry Pi 02W. And this is maybe where things get a little interesting for those of you that are just working on like mixed reality experiences and maybe don't care as much about the BCI part. Um, it happens that in our field for uh, for, for brain-computer interfacing, a lot of our tools, a lot of our ecosystem is built in Python. And you can't run Python on a HoloLens. Uh, at least, if there is a way, please let me know. I've, I've really struggled. So um, a lot of people will just kind of bite that bullet, re-implement what they need in C Sharp and Unity. Um, we, on the other hand, have decided to put an entire outbound computer on the person's head uh, in the form of the Raspberry Pi 02W. We can run uh, Python. We have access to PyTorch, all the state-of-the-art neural decoding packages, and the Pi Zero and the, um, and the HoloLens are on the same Wi-Fi network, so they can talk to each other over IP. And we just uh, facilitate our um, interactions between the two over, over a network. Now, there's one other aspect of this that's really important, and that is that uh, the WebXR, um, this is something you might not be familiar with. It's, it's, it's a uh, um, JavaScript package that acts like a scriptable version of Unity. And we actually host a WebXR server on the Raspberry Pi. It's accessible um, on the same network from the HoloLens. And uh, this WebXR server hosts our, our experience for, um, in this case, the HoloLite demonstration, which um, I'll show you a video of in just a second here, and then I'll take questions. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so we, have, um, we have this WebXR server, and uh, we we're running all of our decoding in Python. Um, also, on the same wireless router, we've got a Philips Hue, um, which is connected to a few um, weird dome-looking lights. They don't look like standard light bulbs, but um, they, they're multicolor RGB lights. And um, the idea here behind this demonstration, which I'll show you a video of in just a second, is that um, we really wanted to provide a look and think BCI. So um, the, the first step of this is, you know, you've got lights in your room, uh, then you put, put the BCI on and, and you, you look in the direction of it and we use the gaze tracking. We know from augmented reality where you're looking um, and then that, that moves a, a cursor kind of around your space and um, when that cursor is on top of one of those light bulbs, then you can use a motor imagery BCI, right? Imagined movement of your hands to action that device, no matter what it is. Um, and, and, and if it's, um, if it's a light, you might turn it on or off. If it's a, a ceiling fan, you might turn that on or off. If it's a TV, well, there's a lot you can do with the TV. So, um, but the point is, is like, uh, you can, uh, the, the, the idea is, is that EEG BCI is very noisy. If I'm moving around, um, you know, or, or doing anything, really, there will be spurious times when my decoders say, hey, he's doing the thing. So it's really nice to be able to use what we know about augmented reality to only direct that decoded action to a device when I'm looking at it, when I'm intending to interact with it. And this is how we can do more with less BCI. I've just spent the last like 20 minutes convincing you that EEG BCI is a very low bandwidth, difficult thing to do that doesn't give you a lot of value. But um, here's the thing, it meshes really well and synergistically with augmented reality and in this way, I'll show the video, you can actually um, do stuff that looks almost like magic. Um, can I actually play this video from here? I don't know, can we? Oh no. 
There we go. Cool. All right, so uh, this is me in, in my uh, um, kind of extra room, I think we call it. Um, and there's two of those lights, one's on the, on the table next to me. And just with a look and think interaction, I can use this BCI to hands-free, without poking at virtual buttons, um, to turn these lights on and off. And by the way, that coffee cup in my hand is serving a lot of purpose right now. I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of squeezing that coffee cup a little bit here uh, to activate the, the BCI. Um, and, and, and it's a hands-free BCI in, in some ways, but, um, but yeah, it, it does kind of look like telepathy in, in a, or telekinesis, important distinction. Telepathy is communication through the brain. Telekinesis is moving or interacting things with the brain, so, so now you know. Um, anyway, that, that type of, uh, of BCI uh, is, is possible now with our system, and there are other types of, of neural interfaces um, that are um, pushing, um, there, there are companies that are pushing in this direction as well. NextMind is another one. They had a commercially available product shortly um, before they were bought up by Snap. It's not actually available anymore. Uh, that's Snapchat, by the way. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's where I'll, I'll stop for today. Um, I'll take questions on, on BCI, and uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> So we have about nine minutes, so you should be able to do three or four questions, depending on how quickly people ask questions. Hello. Hey. Um, quick question. Were you here yesterday to hear any of the talks? Yes, uh, a, a few of them. Actually, I'm, so I'm demoing this thing later today, and it's not working, so I had to step out to try to fix it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, there was a moment yesterday, uh, one of the talks I enjoyed a lot was about... Um, uh, establishing shared understanding between uh, artificial systems and human systems, or humans and, and, and AI. Um, so there is a, a discussion about concurrence um, and agreement and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm wondering if this provides that opportunity to sort of get pre, uh, determine whether or not the artificial system and the human are concurring before the human is consciously concurring. Um, so you, you demonstrated that there were some, for lack of a better word, image targets that you could register whether or not the yep. human was observing those image targets or focusing on those image targets. Uh, the HoloLens itself also has a sensor package that it's registering its understanding of the environment. I'm guessing that that means that you have the ability to process whether or not the HoloLens recognizes the image, the human recognizes the image, and they're in agreement of it before the human's consciously saying that. Yeah, um, really, really great um, uh, prompt there. And actually, something we're starting to look into um, on, on some of our internal sponsored work, um, there's this idea of interest detection, that, that P300 response that I talked about earlier. Um, you can imagine if, if you have yourself or a team of people looking at a, a visual display that's maybe relating something of importance, and three people are looking in the same area and they all have a P300 response at that time, and one person doesn't, you have a pretty good idea that even if they looked in that direction, they didn't have the response that the other people did. So um, but there is a, a means of you know, human facilitating human machine teaming based off of, again, these low fidelity kind of one bit signals of just like interest at a particular time and location. Um, and we're just now starting to investigate this. It's, it's really difficult to get a P300 in a single trial though, which is why I brought up multiple people. If you can average across multiple people instead of multiple time points, it, it, it's a, a novel way of, of, of doing that and increasing a signal to noise ratio. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you've ever heard of the project called OpenBCI, and if you have, how do you feel about it? Yeah, so OpenBCI, actually we're using their hardware, um, the OpenBCI Cyton in the black box. Um, and and it's, it's fun, actually. The, the OpenBCI Cyton, they took the development board for the Texas Instruments ADS-1299, and they just rearranged it and made it look like an octagon, and they made a bunch of them, and they're making great money off of it. The ADS-1299, though, at the heart of this thing is an off-the-shelf $64, um, you know, eight-channel EEG device. We're actually doing our own board spin based off of their uh, PCB because, again, it's all open source. Um, I, I love those guys. I've, I've talked with them many times. Um, we're actually um, internally working on getting one of their new devices, the Galea, which is a VR-integrated um, BCI device. Um, and they're, they're selling it for a decent, decent chunk of change. Um, really great uh, EEG coming off of those things, though. I, I really like that group. Um, my question is that um, 
why use uh, the EEG signal, which is very hard, very small, and, and contaminated by artifact, when the artifact itself is, is, can be more faster and precise? Like when you move your eyes, yeah. when you blink your eyes, that signal is 100 times higher than anything you get from the EEG. So why not just use eye blinks? No. And, and just look at things or do Morse code on with your eyes. This is beautiful, and I wish you were on our uh, funding panels much earlier. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the basic idea is like, you know, the, the artifacts that just happen naturally when you use EEG, jaw clench, eye blink, these are all huge signals. They're easy to decode. Why not just use those? And um, there is a lot of uh, places where those can add huge value. In fact, we have some uh, current work that has just started in the last couple of months with a a DOD sponsor that is interested in utilizing all of the signals, everything that's available to us, to try to deliver um, kind of hands-free control of Android devices. And, and we are, nothing's off the table. We're even putting EEG electrodes over the, uh, the, the larynx so that when you speak, the vibrations cause movement artifact in the EEG electrodes, and we might be able to pick that up. Like, we're, we're going nuts, and we're, we're getting all the muscles we can get, eye blinks, jaw clench, everything's on the table. And actually, it's a, um, a much more usable system than just looking at the neural stuff. So I, I noticed that you, um, your interest is really in the brain controlling uh, external uh, devices. Um, uh, are you work doing anything where external devices control your brain? Yeah. So the stimulation side of this is a, a whole, a whole other, um, a whole other thing. I, I personally don't do much with stimulation. We do have folks here that do. Um, one of the bigger things with neural stimulation, though, is our ability to stimulate at very high fidelity is, is ultimately limited. Um, basically, all neural stimulation direct to the cortex has to be with a brain implant. Um, you can do things like TMS, but it's, you know, your, your area, you're stimulating multiple square centimeters of the brain. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's um, uh, certainly uh, like the whole idea of like the matrix needle that goes up and now I see all of this visual content. It's arguable whether that will ever be possible. Um, but like, yeah, I guess the, the stimulation angle is a huge one that I did not talk about today, and I'd love to have a longer co conversation about it. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. All right. Um, I think that concludes the Q&A portion. So uh, thank you again, Griff Millsap. Yeah.